want to share a couple stories and uh, try and give a little assessment of where we are, but mostly move towards what do we do right now to end this war in Afghanistan, and more largely to end the war-making machine that has ground up so many lives and resources for way too long. My first trip to Afghanistan was in 2004. I had studied a little bit. I knew about what was going on there. I had protested against the war already. We have projects over there that we've supported for over 40 years in healthcare and community development. So it was an opportunity for me to visit them. One day I had a meeting across town in Kabul, and my friend there said, you know, I'm not sure we have a vehicle available today. Uh, do you like to ride bicycles? We could ride across town. Now, I knew enough to know that Kabul was a war zone. And, uh, but I trusted my friend who lived there for many years. And so I said, sure. And he said, well, you know, we might have to carry the bikes for a little bit. And I was like, okay. Um, I put my trust in him. I didn't know the language. I was still learning a sense of what was happening there. And Kabul's a little bit like a figure eight uh, that has two sides to it. And in the middle, there's a very narrow set of roads to connect the two sides with some ridges. So we were going to go up over one of those ridges. So sure enough, we're riding through the traffic, and then we got away from the traffic and started going up the hill, and I was thankful for getting away from the traffic. Um, and then we did get to that point where we had to carry our bicycles, because it was really steep. It was also 6,500 feet above sea level, and my sea level lungs of New York were not adjusting so well. So I said, here I am, I'm trying to kind of figure out about like what's happening in Afghanistan. And I'm going to trip and fall on this rock with a bicycle around my neck. This will not look good. We finally got to a place where it leveled up. I'm hopping and hopping and just thankful to be there. And there is a recent return family. Pakistan. A young boy, and it was about lunchtime. They had just finished, you could tell it was fresh bread. And the mother insisted that we should stop for tea and bread. Though we were these strange foreigners, and it was clear we didn't know what we were doing on the side of the bridge there, and yet we were invited for tea and bread. We said, uh, we have, thank you so much, but we have this urgent meeting we have to get to, and we really, you know, we'd love to stay, but maybe next time on the way back, we will stop. We can't say no. That is quite good. So we finally continued on, but not before having to take a loaf of bread from a refugee family. So I looked back down the road to where we come from. I saw two Afghan women in the distance. They each had large yellow jugs of about five gallons on their shoulders. There is no running water on the side of the ridge. Each day, all of the water for drinking, for cooking, for sanitation and cleaning must come up the hill. And it's carried by women and children. How is the over hundred billion dollars each year that the U.S. is devoting to war, helping that woman and her child, helping the women that daily have to carry water up the hill? Afghanistan has one of the highest infant and maternal mortality rates in the country, in the world. Average life expectancy is 44. Whatever one thinks about the war, shouldn't we all be able to agree that something is not working in the current 
situation and that we should say something about it. Maybe we have something to learn from the Afghan refugee mother and her hospitality to strangers more than anyone in Afghanistan has to learn from us. Well, we still have to get to the meeting. And as we're riding down the other side, my friend was off in a hurry. I was like, I have got to keep up because I don't know, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. And so I said, do you know kind of where we're going? And he, he replied to me, he said, uh, kind of. I know the area we're going to. <laughs> so now I'm not so reassured. He said, but we just need to find an old man. Oh, I said, what's his name? Oh, any old man. <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, there's a new approach to directions here. Right? <laughs> Clearly it's not New York. You know? <laughs> After 30 years of war, every street sign has been destroyed. But an old man would know the name of the street. So we just have to get to the right area, and if we find a guy old enough, he'll remember which street we need to get to. Do we really have something to teach this old man? Or maybe can we be learning something from him? Well, we got there, and sure enough, we found an old man, and not just any old man, it was an old friend of my friends. And they instantly started yelling and screaming at each other. Now, I didn't understand until later exactly what the conversation was about. And uh, a little bit later in the translation, I found out that as soon as he spotted my friend, he said, You owe me money! You never paid me back! Where is it? I want it now! He's like, What? What? I haven't seen you in years. He says, But you owe me money! Pay me now! I said, Now, wait a minute. Didn't I help you with you? You're, you had a well that needed to be repaired. Yes! Yes, you helped me with the well, but that's not paying me back. Where is my money? And that well, did that go to growing crops at all? Did you water your fields? Oh, yes, 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 but where's my money? He says, well, then you were paid back. And they instantly embraced. <laughs> <laughs> this is the banter of Afghan men celebrating seeing each other after a long time. If you don't complain and scream and get angry at the other person, that's not really a sign of respect. <laughs> I'm guessing that some of our leadership in the State Department and the military could learn a little bit from this process. Now, I first got involved over 20 years ago, in 1989, when I was working across the street from the United Nations, and I was doing educational, it was October of 1989. And uh, there was a lot of changes that were about to break forth, not unlike today. Then it was Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. There was a group that wanted to know about changes in the Soviet Union. And it just so happened that that month of October, there were two Soviet veterans from the nearly nine-year war in Afghanistan of the 80s who were coming through Fellowship of Reconciliation on a delegation here to the United States. And so they shared with this group of high school students. They were coming to learn from veterans, U.S. veterans from the Vietnam War. What were they going to learn? Well, if you go back to 1979 when the war started, it started in July of 1979, when then National Security Council advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, sent a memo to President Carter suggesting that we start arming Afghan militias to destabilize the Soviet communist leading government of Afghanistan. In the memo, years later, that became public. Brzezinski said, if we arm Afghan militias to destabilize the government, we may be able to draw the Soviet military into what will become a Vietnam for them. It will demoralize their armed forces. It will bankrupt 
their economy. And it will deeply splinter and divide their political society. Six months later, the Soviet Union took the bait and moved troops into Afghanistan. They were there from December of 1979 until February of 1989. And these two veterans that I met were among that group. It wasn't their choice. It was their leader's choice. But they were the ones that were called to serve. 1989, 10 years after Chbosinski's claim of three things that could happen, the Soviet army left. It was deeply demoralized. Its economy was bankrupt. And its political life was deeply divided. And within a couple of years, the Soviet Union collapsed. So, what makes us think that a foreign occupying military coming into Afghanistan a few years later, what do you think is going to happen? Look at our armed forces. With repeat deployments, soldiers are deeply demoralized, facing unimagined levels of mental health issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicides. More U.S. soldiers died from suicide in 2010 and in 2009 than were killed in combat. More than one a day directs the violence against themselves. Something is not working. Now, the largest debtor nation in the world is, any guesses? <laughs> Somehow or another. Okay. So on point one, Brzezinski's plan is, is happening. Point two, bankrupting the economy. Point three, how are we doing politically? We're kind of really mellow and getting along with one another right now. <laughs> Okay, so this memo from 1979 is happening again. If you have any doubts about this, consider what the Secretary of, I think we should rename it, not Secretary of Defense, but really um, Secretary of Aggression and Invasion, um, Robert Gates, said at West Point on February 25th, if any future Defense Secretary recommends a large-scale land force in Asia, or the Middle East, or Africa, they should have their head examined. So, could, tonight I'd like to just say, let's take him up on the challenge. I mean, he's invited us, I think this is a moment of candor, and so let us examine the heads of the leadership definition of insanity is to repeat the same action over and over and expect a different result. Now last fall, uh, actually a year and a half ago, Admiral Mullen, the head of Joint Chiefs of Staff, was uh, being interviewed by the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee. He was up for renomination. And so Lindsey Graham, senator from South Carolina, one of those left-wing uh, senators, was asking some tough questions. So we said, after a moment, uh, Taliban, how many uh, airplanes do they have? Says, well, I have a moment, I don't think they have any, sir. And tanks, how many tanks do they have? He says, well, uh, I don't think they have any tanks, sir. And, uh, but, they're winning. <laughs> How are they? Like, so they're popular. Oh, no, 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 no. So nobody likes to talk. He says, wait a minute. They have no air force. They have no tanks. They're wildly unpopular. And yet, they're winning. I think we have a problem in Afghanistan. How do they do it? At no moment. They watch us, they're very good, and it's their country.
That has nothing to do with 9-11. The tragedy in Afghanistan today is that we in the U.S. have refused to acknowledge that we have launched a massively destructive war and inflicted it on a society that's been racked by decades of war with no particular goal in mind, where no Afghans were involved in anything related to what the U.S. government has claimed that this war is about, until we can somehow get political leadership to acknowledge that, we will be struggling for a long time. Counterinsurgency is supposed to win the hearts and minds of the people. Really, it is um, not counterinsurgency, but congressional inspiration. That's what COIN stands for. Congressional inspiration. That it is a strategy to win the hearts and minds of Congress for more unquestioning and to win the hearts and minds of Congress and the administration to militarization of problem solving. That problems are first and foremost solved by the military and not by negotiations, not by other avenues of humanitarian work or just good relationships between neighbors. So this notion of counterinsurgency was never about winning the hearts and minds of Afghans. And we need to just make that clear. David Petraeus has said we need to protect the Afghan people in this manual on counterinsurgency as exponentially escalated night raids and aerial bombardments since last June when he took over. I didn't think it was possible for someone to make General McChrystal look thoughtful and restrained in Afghanistan, and General Petraeus has found a way to do that. The escalation of drone strikes in Pakistan have also created huge resentment on civilian casualties. There is an Afghan saying that I think actually describes what's happening with the U.S. policy. This is uh, Afghans love problems. It's one of the delights for me to sort of hear these proverbs. They come from lots of different contexts. Uh, and I'll try and share a few of them. Remind me if I forget to share a few others. Um, this one's a little harsh. But the situation right now in Afghanistan is quite harsh. Thrust your sword deeper into my belly so that my short dagger can reach you. That's pretty harsh, right? So, what has Robert Gates done and the U.S. military done in the last couple of years? More than triple the number of troops in Afghanistan from 2008 now to 2010 or 2011. Escalated drone strikes exponentially. Covert operations are escalating. Night raids are escalating. Is it any wonder that civilian casualties are escalating as well? The sword is being thrust deeper and deeper, and the result is more and more blood. It may be hard for us to imagine, but I think Afghans far prefer to fight with words than with weapons. They have been a way station 
on international trading routes for millennia. Marco Polo was lost and wandering around and stopped through Afghanistan. Alexander the Great stopped through Afghanistan way before. Many, many empires have wandered through. So Afghan's culture, I've learned, is one of the most extravagantly hospitable cultures in the world. If you're in a harsh climate uh, with droughts that happen regularly, and someone takes the wrong turn on the road and needs a place to stop, you, your life depends on the hospitality of strangers. So extending hospitality like that refugee woman offering us bread was part of what Afghans have been doing for century after century after century to total strangers. And have some tea. You've heard the book, uh, no doubt, Three Cups of Tea. <coughs> uh, you know, in an oral tradition, news comes from other people, not from a screen. Um, they love sitting down and talking and having tea and learning about maybe you have something to trade. Uh, maybe after we yell at each other a little bit and we have a few cups of tea, uh, we can come to an agreement of, of, of um, what to exchange. But if you come in with weapons and ideas to impose on Afghans as strangers and don't bother to learn the language and don't bother to understand what the dynamics and interactions are, you will not only not be welcome, you won't last long. So, one of the most gracious and hospitable places in the world can also be a graveyard for him. How do we begin to turn this around? I think we have a choice now in the peace movement. And I want to just put it out there for us so you can think. Some of us are feeling despairing and desperate and are looking for little bits of hope. So we're thinking, you know, maybe we can get a few more Democrats and like one or two Republicans to sign on to a certain bill in Congress. And that will show progress. After all, when the authorization for force happened in September of 2011, Barbara Lee was the only voice in Congress, the only voice to express dissent. So if we got 100 voices now, we're all, you know, like we're that much further along, right? But meanwhile, the world <coughs> keeps going. Or maybe we can see about getting a little more humanitarian aid in the overall military spending package, or cut out one weapon system. So that's one option. I think there's another option. We have perhaps one of the greatest opportunities right now to trip up and undo the military-industrial complex like never before because it's more powerful than ever before. You know, in Taekwondo and various other kinds of martial arts, the bigger your opponent is, the harder and easier it is for that momentum. One little foot is all you need. You don't really need a lot. So let me ask in Egypt, how many tanks did the people have when they took to the streets to end 30 years of military rule? How many, how many tanks did they have? How many other kinds of, you know, Air Force, how much did they have? They used the strength of numbers and the strength of moral conviction and the strength of throwing off our fears to say, you know what, we're taking to the streets. We've been paralyzed by fear for 30, 40, 50 years. And people across the Arab world are doing the same. Tunisia, not a single tank was used. And a dictator of over 20 some years, gone. It's a little bit like 1980. So, let me just say, if, if, uh, if anyone's feeling like our raising of a few thousand dollars here this evening doesn't quite match the um, billions that will be devoted to war, great! We're right where we need to be, okay? So we have far more power 
than the Pentagon. Far more power. In Wisconsin, folks are taken to the streets and folks have started translating science into Arabic. Have you seen that on some of the uh, coverage? They're like, we are Egyptians too. Or democracy in Egypt, democracy in Wisconsin. We're learning from each other. There are plenty of nonviolent ways. Now, in case we doubt this, I just want to give a little credit to a corrupt leader of one of the most corrupt governments in the world, uh, that's uh, Afghanistan, President Karzai. <laughs> he had a problem. Remember, he had an election about a year and a half ago? And, and what happened with that election? Well, he won. Yes, uh, he figured it out. He told folks, I need to win, so just do the number, do the math. And uh, there was massive fraud, massive fraud. It wasn't even like disguised. A polling station that opened at 6.30 in the morning at 6.35 had more votes in its box than there were voters in the district. <laughs> this was really corruption in, a, in, in true efficiency. I mean, you know, this is, let's just get some credit on efficiency here. Look at what happened in the year after that. He was widely discredited. The Obama administration was like, oh, this is the guy that we're devoting billions of dollars to support against the Taliban? This is not looking very good. Now, one of the things that Karzai did was he looked at resources. And he saw that about 85% of aid coming into the country was going to private sources. So that's not right. We need about 85% of the aid to go to government sources, because then I can say who the guys are in the ministries, and they can say where the money goes. So he was just looking at a need to reallocate the resources, somewhat like the story of the cookies. Um, so he said, I need a high-level meeting with the Obama administration just to sort things out, you know, face-to-face -face in Washington. Well, of course, the administration said, no way, you just presided over one of the most corrupt elections in history, and you want us to kind of like, no, we're not going to have it. So, watch what happens in the last year with no guns and no money. Garzai says, I think I'll go visit my neighbor, my newfound friend, uh, Ahmadinejad, in uh, Iran. So he pays a visit, he invites Ahmadinejad to come to Kabul, and so they start talking with each other. And the White House said, wait a minute, I think we need to pay you a visit and set you straight about which neighbors you're supposed to work with and which neighbors not. Uh, so Obama came in the middle of the night last spring to Kabul. Now, in a context of hospitality, imagine inviting yourself to someone else's house in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m., to chew them out of like what a bad person they are and what terrible things they are and how they need to kind of like get their life together. That's about as rude in protocol as one could get. And yet, Karzai, corrupt and all, is a gracious host, so please, welcome, come. Uh, even at 3 a.m., we'll provide you something. Of course, I keep it stable. So, watch what happens. He, he hosts him, welcomes him. Obama is barely back in Washington when Karzai is announcing, you know, the way things are going, I'm going to have to join the Taliban. Do you remember that? I mean, he says that, he said that a number of times since then. But he actually said, I've got to join the Taliban. I don't think there was a single Afghan of any party, uh, the Taliban, or the warlords, the Northern Alliance, uh, the government, who believed in it. He had been shaken and had to restore respect. As an Afghan proverb, a wound, a bad wound, can heal. But a bad word never does. So how do you restore respect? Whether you deserve it or not is another matter. You threaten to join someone's enemies. Well, when he said, I think I may have to join the Taliban. The White House said, you know, you need to come to Washington, D.C. for a high-level visit. It's like, well, thank you very much. I've been wanting that for about nine months now, but now that you're offering, thank you. I mean, look at what happened from a corrupt, stolen election and widely being discredited with no weapons and no guns. 
Karzai was able to orchestrate exactly what he wanted and a commitment from the U.S. and NATO allies to funnel more money through government ministries. Can't we learn something even from corrupt leaders about non-violent ways of doing things? So what do we do? Quickly, I think we need to leave. And if, uh, my good friend Phyllis Bennis, who I know spoke here a number of years ago at the dinner, and I have a whole book on ending the U.S. war. I won't go through all the different pieces, but I think the only way, taking a lesson from Karza, taking a lesson from Egypt and Tunisia, and across the Arab world, and from Wisconsin, and from Ohio, and from Indiana, we need to use the power of our diplomacy to say, we are leaving, and we are leaving soon. What do you suppose the warlords will do if they're slush funds and cash cow of the U.S. is leaving? They'll change their team. What do you think the government officials will do? Right now, there is no incentive whatsoever for Afghans to do well in training in the police or the army. Now, the notion that Afghans can't fight and they, they need, like, really, you know, good training from the U.S. and from Italy and from Germany. So what are the Taliban doing? Like, have they trained already in Germany? They trained already here in the States? I mean, they know how to fight with only weapons that they carry and do quite well. But if there's not a good reason to fight, and there's money to be had and a non-violent strategy, it's like, wow, these guys are paying us and saying they're training us, but they'll do the fighting until we're ready? You know what, I'm not feeling ready yet. <laughs> I need another month's salary, please. It's not much, but I'm not ready. Please, take it to them, you know? I mean, look at this. They are laughing at the U.S. Sure. And you listen to U.S. military experts and say, well, they, uh, you know, it's going to take a long time and, and tough training and, you know, we're working with them. <coughs> so, patronizing. That will go nowhere until we start respecting Africans as having something to teach us and that together we might be able to find a path. As troops have escalated, casualties have also escalated because Improvised explosive devices are the major casualties for our troops and for civilians. They're only planted on roads where the troops go. No troops, no IEDs, no civilian casualties in that area. So, lighten up the troops. It's very easy that that will lighten up the casualties. Now, there's a problem of this budget thing that Brzezinski talked about, his second strategy of bankrupting the economy. Um, The Republic, I'm not partisan about parties or whatever, but one particular party in Congress has said they want to cut $100 billion. I have a plan. If you get rid of 50,000 troops at $1 million a year per soldier, that cuts 50 billion, so you're halfway there. If you get rid of 100,000 troops and withdraw completely, Phyllis Bennis and I have presented a $100 billion savings plan uh, from over a year ago. That would work. That would solve all, I mean, Congress could just go home, take a break, you know, I don't know, whatever they do. Uh, but they said they're hundred million right there. I have a few other ideas about saving even more money. I think probably 500 billion could be saved, at least. Um, some of you may have heard of the 25% plan, I feel certain about that. Yeah, that's, well, my sense is that it should be 25% is the most of the Pentagon that's left. You want to cut at least 75%? The U.S. has a 25% budget. Um, that would be roughly $300 billion. It does $1.2 billion. $1.2 trillion is the amount we devote to national security and war spending each year. None of that's on the table. Veterans benefits. 
retirement benefits for folks that then become lobbyists for war profiteers. There's this whole CIA covert operations budget, billions of that. We need to get control of all this, and it's quite simple. We just need to start saying no. Now, we need some allies to do that. We will not, as a peace movement, turn the military budget around and address human needs in our communities, let alone address human needs in Afghanistan or in Iraq or in other countries, if we don't ally with the labor movement. is that the labor movement has no hope of protecting public sector employees or any trade unions if it does not join in ending the war machine and military <laughs> So, we need a few more allies, even with the labor movement and the peace movement and churches and communities of faith. I want to suggest that we go to our state assemblies and senates, our city governments and towns that are facing massive budget cuts, cuts in services, and layoffs. And to say, you know, you've already paid the money that's needed to restore all these cuts, to save the jobs. The money has been taken out of Pennsylvania, taken out of Bethlehem, and Wilkes-Barre, and Philadelphia, and New York, and other communities taken out of Wisconsin to go to war. In Wisconsin, they're facing a $1.8 billion deficit, which is created from all the fury and protests. $1.7 billion has already been voted on to be taken out of Wisconsin and sent to Afghanistan in the form of military spending. It's roughly the same in every community. So think about your town, your community. There's a school budget, $1 million per soldier. How many soldiers, let's just have a, like a raffle of we'd like to bring X number of soldiers home from Bethlehem uh, in order to fund public education, to fund transportation, to fund <laughs> and everyone else to say, let's just pledge, you know, like, you want three soldiers? Oh, well, I want ten soldiers. Well, actually, I'd like about 1,500 soldiers. And, you know, we're willing to put that money to good work right here, right now, if you just bring the folks home. My wife is a public school principal in the South Bronx, which is now the poorest congressional district in the country. As I was talking about this, she said, three soldiers. That's all it would take to run my school or another elementary school in the South Bronx. Probably one soldier, two soldiers, would really make after-school programs available so kids don't have to be on the streets. How can we get them to come home so that they're safe and that our communities here are safe? That's the challenge for us today. So let me end and I'll open up for questions with another Afghan proverb. You can't carry two watermelons with one hand. <laughs> so, if we're facing this, I don't know, you might, you know, like if you're working with, you know, sort of a uh, little, you know, kind of ex experiment on this, of like how to kind of teach this notion of uh, building a peace movement, of building a labor movement, building a justice movement to bring back the swords and beat them into plowshares, you're going to need a few hands to carry those watermelons together. That's what we're about to make, and that's the task ahead of us, is to join hands and carry those watermelons to end the war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Iraq, across the world. Thank you very much.